time this morning, greet people around you. Don't be afraid to learn a new face or a new name today.
Thanks for singing with us. You may be seated. Last week we had a baptism, and we want to share that with you right now. My name is Robert James, and today I'm going to be baptized. I want to be baptized because, um, because throughout life I've had some hard times. My mom and my dad getting a divorce, so that was pretty hard, and I just want to be a child of God. What excites me the most is knowing that, like, my sins will go away, so, like, and I'll be a child of God. One of the things that's really cool about today is that we're a church that wants to lead generations to follow Jesus together, and Robert has with him his entire family, mom, grandparents, and great-grandma, four generations here today. So, yeah, we're all very proud of you, Robert, and we're, we're excited, so I'm going to ask you to repeat after me. Are you ready to do that? Yes, sir. Yes, all right. I believe. I believe. That Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the living God. The Son of the living God. And I accept him. And I accept him. As my Lord. As my Lord. And as my Savior. And as my Savior. Love it, man. Love it. All right, let's do it. Robert, because your confession of faith, I now baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not a bad way to start a Sunday morning, right? Not at all. Hey, good morning, everybody. My name is Luke. I'm the youth minister here on staff at Corinth, and we're glad that all of you are here. Hey, if you're a guest and you're joining us uh, this morning, we want to say a special welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Uh, we would love to connect with you, and there's a few ways that that can happen. Uh, first, in the seat back right in front of you, there's a card that says, Let's Connect. You can pull it out, fill it out, and then drop it in the bucket as it's passed by later on in the service. Or you can pull out your phone and go over to corinth.cc. Uh, there you can click I'm New and fill that out, and we'll connect with you that way. Uh, also, after the service is over, make sure you head out these double doors out here and over to the guest services kiosk. That there will be someone to greet you and to give you a gift, our way of saying it means the world that you are with us here this morning. Okay, I have a little bit of, uh, I have a couple questions for all of you, and I want you to raise your hand if it applies. Okay, so how many of you have a car? Okay, <laughs> lots of hands up for that. Now, here's the second question. Raise your hand again if it applies to you. How many of you have nothing to do next Sunday evening from 6 to 8? Still some hands? I think some of you know where I'm headed with this, and so you're hesitant to raise your hand, right? Yeah? Hey, we, uh, we are having trunk or treat next week, uh, Sunday from 6 to 8, and we still need some trunks. So our number right now is 65, and we're looking to get 100. Now, that means that many of you can come help us out. So here's what I'm going to ask. Head out to the concourse, and there's a little table out there with sign-ups for a trunk. So sign up for a trunk uh, so that we can put that event on very well for our community. There are two reasons you should do it. First of all, because a prize is going to be given to the best trunk, so there's a little bit of a competitive nature to it, right, if you're into competition. Uh, but the second reason is because we're a church that wants to lead generations to follow Jesus together. And what a great way to reach out to the community and to generations and be a part of their story, hopefully, for change uh, for the gospel. And so join us next week, Trunk or Treat 6 to 8, uh, so that we can make that happen. Our next steps event continue to go on today at 1130 in Founders Hall right after this service is Changemaker. If you're at a point right now where you're looking uh, to get more involved here at Corinth or you're thinking, man, I want to I want to step up. I want to serve a little bit more or uh, I want to make a little bit of a difference. This is this event's for you. So come on out. Join us uh, so that you can learn how that you can get connected and plugged in here and in the community as well. So join us for that. For everything else, check out your bulletin, uh, check out social media, check out corinth.cc uh, so that you don't miss out on anything that you want to be a part of, uh, and, and we'll be good with that. Here in a moment, Jeremy and the band are going to come back up and lead us in some more worship. We'll take communion together, uh, and then you'll hear uh, a sermon from our senior minister, Adam Turner. We're in week three of Jonah, so Jonah chapter three. We've got some exciting things to talk about this morning, so we hope you'll be blessed by that. Here's what we'll do. We'll pray, and we'll move on with the service. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to gather together as a community and lift you high. 
Uh, God, I pray that uh, as, we, as we sing and as we concentrate and as we learn that you would put all of our distractions aside uh, and that we would be focused on who you are and what you continue uh, to do for us. God, we are just so grateful and so thankful and we praise you uh, for the fact that you sent your son to take our place. And God, it's that, it's that truth that I pray moves us all to worship you this morning. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
sinless, perfect Lamb of God be slain upon a cross and take on all of our sins, the sins of the whole world, and die a death that we deserve. Father, we praise you for the hope of the resurrection, the hope of abundant life that we have in you through your Son, Jesus. So thankful for that, Father. Please accept our praises in Jesus' name. My wife, Jenny, and I, we have three kiddos, and our youngest is Everly, and uh, she is 18 months old, and she is just a delight. She's tons of energy and tons of fun. One of the great things about her right now is her baby babble is beginning to become words. She's beginning to learn words, and so she can say daddy and mommy and bubby, and she can almost say sissy. She just goes, sss, and we know that that's her sissy for now, and um uh, She's a delight, but there's one word that she knows that we did not teach her. It's a word that she learned herself, and it's the word mine. <laughs> yeah, and she knows how to use that word mine. She's very effective with it when she needs to get that toy or she wants to keep that toy from brother or sister or anything. Mine. It's amazing how quick we learn to go after the things that we want. And don't you wish we were a little quicker to unlearn that word and that attitude. You know, I bet if we took some time right now and just uh, opened up our phones and looked through the news headlines, we would see a lot of news of grown men and grown women doing a lot of things that we might shake our heads about. And we might even hear, if we were to really examine it, an 18-month-old baby somewhere back in there screaming, mine, this is what I want, and I'll do whatever it takes to get what I want. But there was one who came and who lived among us and did not live in a selfish manner. He lived selflessly, and he, he is Jesus. And we see probably no better picture of this than at the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus prays to the Father, and he says, Father, take this cup from me, but not my will, but your will be done. And, of course, we know the rest of the story that Jesus gives his life on the cross, that he dies for the sins of of the world. This morning we're going to take communion and we're going to remember that very fact as we hold the bread. We remember that Jesus gave up his will and he gave up his body for us. As we drink the juice, we remember that his blood was shed for us. This morning as you take communion, picture this. You stand before the Father and all your sins, all the things that you've done wrong, the, the lies that you've told, the evil that you've committed. They're, they're heaped up on your shoulders and they're weighing you down. But Jesus comes and he looks at you and he looks at me and he says, mine. And he takes our sins off of our shoulders and in exchange he gives us his righteous life. And so as we stand now before the Father, we stand perfected and forgiven. And God the Father looks at us and he says, mine, my children. Let's pray together. God, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent Jesus to die for us, to take our sins upon himself. Jesus, we thank you uh, that you paid that price, and we want to come and honor you and remember you and say thank you today in this time of communion. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Here in just a second, our guys are going to pass around some buckets, and we'll have a chance to be able to um, give this morning. Uh, we know a lot of y'all have already done that online, and uh, for that we say thank you. Uh, but this is a chance for those of us who are present to be able to uh, support what God's doing here at Corinth. If you're a guest, I want to invite you to drop off your communication cards, I'm new here cards, uh, decision cards, serve cards. Really, if any of y'all have a card to drop off, you can drop that off um, here in the bucket. So uh, thank you for your generosity. Thank you for supporting what God is doing here. Let's pray, and uh, we'll do some preaching this morning. Heavenly Father, we, we love you so much, and uh, we thank you that you have been um, good to us. And we're praying today that as we bring our tithes and offerings, um, that we would use the, that uh, you would help us to use those here uh, to continue to lead generations to follow Jesus together. And uh, so, God, please bless these tithes and these offerings. And uh, God, now as we turn our attention to the scriptures, to the story of Jonah, we pray that you give us ears to hear uh, what we need to hear today, and that you'd help me to say what needs to be said and keep me from saying things that shouldn't today. And we pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. 
Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Adam, and I'm the senior minister here at Corinth. If you're a guest, I want to say welcome, and I thank you so much uh, for coming out to be with us this morning. I would love nothing more than a chance to say hello to you um, after the service. So if you would, uh, please stop by the guest service kiosk, just straight ahead out those doors, and I'll be there. I'll have a gift bag to put in your hand, just a small way of us being able to say thanks for being here today, uh, because it really does mean the world to us uh, that you're here this morning. I also want to say hey to our friends who are watching us online. We hope you're having a great day wherever you find yourself. And, and we know most people check us out online before they ever step foot in here. And so we hope we'll see you here in person real soon. In fact, we think next Sunday would be a great Sunday to be your first Sunday with us here in person. Uh, so let's, let's make that happen. So let's do this real quick. Turn to your neighbor and just say this. It rained at my house yesterday. All right. Just, just do that. Just a little bit, you know, just, just a little bit of rain uh, yesterday. Good stuff though kind of in need. Well, today uh, we are going to be in the book of Jonah again. So if you've got a Bible, I'd invite you to open up to Jonah chapter 3. Um, if you don't have a Bible, um, you can follow along on the screen. It's in your notes. It's, uh, uh, or you can go to Bible.com as well. If you're using a paper Bible and you're trying to figure out where it is, you can go to the book of Matthew and go backwards seven books and you'll find it. Um, or you can use the table of contents. No judgment here. Um, it's a tough little thing to find every once in a while. But uh, if you're new, the story of Jonah is very familiar to most of us in the room. It's a story about a prophet that God comes to and says, hey, I want you to go to Nineveh. He, that's the city he wants him to go to. It's the, the capital of Assyria. It's about the year 775 BC. He says that Nineveh's wickedness has come up before me. And if you were uh, with us in week one, we talked about that wickedness. You know, in the VeggieTales movie, um, what they say is that their wickedness is that they slapped people with fishes. And that's probably the best G-rated way to put, you know, they filleted people and alive and beheaded them. You know, that's probably better. Let's just go and slap people with fishes, right? You know, because but that, that's what it is. And that, that wickedness is just, God says, it comes up, it's coming up before me. He says, so I want you to go and I want you to preach to him. And Jonah says, no, um, really don't want to do that. And so instead of going to Nineveh, he gets on a boat headed in the opposite direction, going as far west as he possibly can to the ends of the earth. While he's there, God throws a great big storm on the, on the sea. It overwhelms the boat to the place where they think they're all going to die. Jonah tells the sailors, just throw me overboard. Everything will be fine. They finally throw him overboard. The sea calms. God provides a, a great big fish. It swallows Jonah up. He's in there for three days and three Three nights, he finally prays. The, the fish vomits him up onto dry land. And that's where we ended in chapter 2. Chapter 3, we're going to get to see uh, what Jonah does in response to this. But it's, it's an incredible story. And as we've been kind of walking through it, I want to just summarize it like this for you. All right, This isn't in your notes. If you want to scribble it down, feel free to. But in, in chapter 1, what we see is that Jonah uh, runs from God. Okay, He runs from God's command. He runs from the word that God gives him. He runs away from God. In chapter 2, we see Jonah run to God. Okay, He goes to God in prayer. And he says, finally, he's like, okay, you know, God, what I have vowed to do, I, I, I will do. Chapter 3, which is today, we're going to see Jonah run with God. Okay, He's going to go in the direction that God wants him to go. And in chapter 4, we're going to see Jonah Next week, you got to come back if you want. I'm going to leave it just like that, all right? Just leave it like that, okay? But so today is all about second chances. And we all love the idea of a second chance. We all want second chances in our lives. Like, I want Missouri to have a second chance against Vanderbilt, all right? Um, if you didn't watch us, I mean, Vanderbilt, y'all don't know this. They are a powerhouse, okay? That, that's what the problem is. They are an incredible, the best one in five team that has ever played the game, all right? And so I, I want a second chance for Missouri on that. I, I want a second chance for Patrick Mahomes to actually have a knee again. You know, that, that's what I want. He lost his kneecap on, you know, Thursday. And so I want a second chance for, for that. I, I want second chances for me. Uh, there have been conversations I've had with Jennifer, my, my wife, and it's just been like, I like another go at that one, you know, because that didn't quite come out the way I wanted it to. There, there have been sermons that I have preached and I get home and it's just like, can I do that again? Can I just get everybody back together and we'll just do this again? Because I just like another shot at that. You ever wanted a second chance? Yeah, we, we've all wanted second chances. And that's what this story is about. We're going to see a second chance just present itself to Jonah. It's in Jonah chapter 3, uh, verse 1. This is what it says. It says, then the word of the Lord came to Jonah. Say it with me. It came to Jonah a second time. Okay, so this is the second time that the word of God comes to Jonah. The first time's in chapter 1, the second time's here in chapter 3. Second time is a second chance. 
right? It's the second chance that Jonah gets. So here's the first lesson today from Jonah chapter 3. It says, our God is a God of second chances, okay? Our God is a God of second chances. He gives second chances. So let me ask you a question. I'm going to give you the answer right now. The answer is no, okay? So the first two services have have had trouble with this. They don't know how to answer it, okay? So I'm giving you the answer up front. Did Jonah deserve a second chance? No, you guys are so smart. I mean, like, really, you guys aren't. No, he doesn't deserve a second chance. I mean, he's a prophet of God. God spoke to him and said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to get up and to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach a message that I'm going to give you. Get up and go do that. And Jonah is a prophet of God. His number one job is to do what? To tell people what God told him to tell them. And Jonah says, oh, don't want to. I don't want to do that. Jonah doesn't deserve a second chance. Jonah deserves to be a greasy spot in the road. That's what he deserves. That the God of the universe, the one who spoke to them, has every right to just wipe him out of existence. But thankfully, our God is a God of second chances because the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. He got a second chance. You know, there are those of us who are here today, and we've never surrendered to God. We've never surrendered to his will. We've never surrendered to him and said, whatever you want, Lord. We, we've never surrendered our heart to him and just said, you know, God, whatever you want in my life, I, I need you. We've never done that. Well, today, you're not here by chance. You're here today because God wants you to know that he's giving you a second chance and that he has a plan for you and that he wants you to, to dive into that. He's coming to you today in this moment. Others of us, we we have a relationship with God. But like Jonah, we have been disobedient. And we have run from his call. We have run from the thing that he has asked us to do. And we have been disobedient. We have not followed him wherever he has asked us to go. And so today, we're going to have a chapter 2 moment. And that chapter 2 moment is whenever Jonah says, What I have vowed, I will make good. And today, that's why you're here. You're going to say, I'm coming back. I'm going to take this second chance. I'm going to take this third chance, this fifth chance, this 112th chance that God is giving me in this moment. And I'm going to go with you and not against you any longer. It's a lot of our stories, isn't it? I know it's my story. I became a Christian at the ripe old age of eight. I was baptized in May of 1987. And what what I knew is that I wanted Jesus as my Savior. Because I didn't want to go to hell, right? I mean, because like even at eight, you can kind of get hell sounds hot and forever is a long time. I don't want that. I knew I wanted Jesus to be my Savior. And so I I put my faith in him. I was was baptized into Christ in 1987. But stop me if you've heard a story like this before. In my teenage years, anybody heard this story? Have you all lived that story, right? Um, I, I experienced a couple of crises of faith. And, you know, whenever you face a crisis of faith, you've got two options. Uh, one is you can run towards God in that moment of crisis. Two is you can run from him in your moment of crisis. And I chose to run from God in that moment. That as things got difficult, instead of running to him for help, I ran away from him. So whenever my parents split up, I ran. I I ran from God. Whenever my parents got back together, instead of running to God and saying, thank you so much for doing this, I just kept running from God. And I ran all the way up until I was 17 years old. And uh, the the local churches in Carthage, Missouri, which is where I'm from, um, they decided they were going to have an event um, in, in the area, and they were all going to get together, going to have a rally, okay? And they came up with this super creative name. Ready for it? It's called Carthage for Jesus, all right? Super creative, right? You know, just like, oh, okay, great. But anyway, so they had as the keynote speaker, the guest preacher, it was Mike Singletary. Now, man, how many of y'all remember Mike Singletary? Okay, Chicago, the, the Bears, you know, he's from the Bears. He's one of the middle linebackers for the Bears, number 50. You know, just an incredible set. He, he's an incredible believer. He follows Jesus. And so he was up there preaching. And for me, what happened is the word of the Lord came to Adam a second time. A second time. And it was God saying, here's your second chance. 
Here's your chance to be obedient. Here's your chance to follow me. And, and so what I did is I surrendered. And I said, here's my next opportunity to walk with God, to run with him and not away from him. See, our God is a God of second chances. He provides these to us. He, we do not deserve them. He provides second chances, third chances, more chances than we could ever, ever imagine or deserve. That's why we call it grace. That's why we sing that it's amazing. Because we don't deserve it, we can't earn it, but he gives those second chances to us because that's who he is. Our God is a God of second chances. Praise God for second chances. In fact, turn to your neighbor real quick and say, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for second chances. Just tell him that right now. Come on now, tell him I'm grateful for second chances because we're praising God for second chances, right? God gives us second chances. Our God is a God of second chances. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Came to Jonah a second time, and this is what it says. Read the first word of the command with me right here. Ready? Here we go. Go. Go to the great city of Nineveh. And proclaim to it the message that I give you. Go. In other words, get up. Stop sitting there. Stop standing there. There's work for you to do. Get up. Immediately seize this opportunity. Because whenever God gives you a second chance, a third chance, a fourth chance, you want to know what you should do? You should go. And you should go right now. And you should take that opportunity right now immediately. Because if you wait until later... If you wait until later, you, you may talk yourself out of actually obeying God. You may come up with all these different reasons of why you shouldn't do that. But whenever God gives you a second chance, you should go immediately and do what he asks you to do. Some of you have a second chance today. And that God has laid out something for you and he wants you to do it. There's something he wants you to do. There's somebody he wants you to, to reach out to, to share your faith with, to, to invite to church, to, be, to come to church with you. There, there's somebody that, that, that you know you need to apologize to. Some of you, there's like, you know that there's something that you need to give away, that you need to give, you need to sell. Other things, there's sins that you know that you need to repent of, that you need to turn away from. There's something that you need to make right. And, and the word of the Lord has come to you a second time, a third time a fourth time, and you want to know what you need to do? You need to go. And you need to obey what God has asked you to do. And you don't wait. You seize the opportunity right now. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. It's weird to call Nineveh a great city. And whenever you're known for filleting people alive, skinning them alive, burying them, beheading them kind of thing, like, really? We're going to use the word great? I don't know about that. Like, demonic, maybe, but great? It really was. I mean, you, you take the whole pyramid of head things out of the equation, and it was a great city. You know, it really was. You know, it, was, it, was kind of, it had great power, great influence. It's kind of like a New York City of the day. You know, one of those places where just culture just flows from, just a cultural epicenter. That, that, that's Nineveh. And so God says, hey, this is an important city, so I'm going to send you to go to that. And he gives them the same command that he gives in chapter 1. He's like, you're going to go to Nineveh. I want you to preach against them, and that, that's what I want you to do. But this is what it says in verse 3. It says this, Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. He obeyed the word of the Lord. The, the key word in that sentence is Obeyed. You might want to circle that, highlight that, underline that, put a star next to it, check marks next to it, put the date next to it, all right? Because this is the most important phrase here. It is obey. This is the first time in this entire book that Jonah has obeyed God. Every other thing, it's been Jonah's own desires, and he has disobeyed the entire time. First time he obeys. And he finally says, okay, God, I'll go, I'll preach, and I'll do whatever you want me to do. So here's the second lesson. You ready? Whenever you're given a second chance, take it. Don't delay. Take it, seize it, act upon it. You've been given a second chance. Don't take it for granted. Take the second chance. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now, Nineveh was a very large city. 
took three days to go through it. And Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming, 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. And it's a big city. The, uh, the archaeologists have found that it has like about seven miles worth of walls around it. Interior speaking, we're talking about 1,800 acres or so. Um, about 120,000 people lived in the city. Um, but that doesn't count the burbs, you know, that are kind of like the, you know, metro Nineveh. You know, it's kind of, kind of around there. And a lot of people that live in this area. And it, so it's a big place. It takes three days to go through the city. And so you can kind of picture Jonah just kind of walking the streets. He's got a sandwich board on, ringing a bell. The sign says the end is near, you know. And just kind of walking along there. And he's preaching the sermon. Forty days, Nineveh will be overturned. Forty days, Nineveh will be overturned. It's a super short sermon, okay? It really, really is because everybody loves a short sermon. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, good luck. All right. And so, um, but it, in, in Hebrew, it's only five words. It's a five word long sermon. That's all there is to it. It's just gloom and doom, you know, kind of thing. And the Ninevites definitely understand this idea that we're going to be overthrown. We're going to be destroyed here. But this, this word here, you know, overthrown or over, you know, churn, overthrown, you know, it, it is a word that has actually it has two meanings. You know, because we, we know that there are words that have multiple meanings. Like you take the word right, right? You know, like we all understand, you know, like right can mean, well, you're right. Or um, you need to take a, a right turn at the next stop sign. This is why you get in fights in the car with your wife. It's like, all right, so do I need to turn left here? She says, right. <laughs> all right, so I turn left. Right, uh-huh. Now, do I turn left here or, or not? Right. You know what the right answer, let me help everybody. You know what the right answer is there? Correct or yes, something like that, all right? So, so we understand that. So right can mean right, it can mean right. It can also mean like something like, you know, water is, you know, clean water is a basic human, Right. So we know words have different meanings. Well, this word here for overthrown, it can mean one of two things. It can mean destruction or it can mean repentance. Oh. So Jonah's message can be summarized as this. You've got 40 days. And you will either be destroyed or you'll be changed forever. And that's the message he preaches. It's like in 40 days, Nineveh will be overthrown 40 days. You want to know what that means? Uh, 40 days is what it means, all right? But, but you want to know what it really means? There's a time limit. That Nineveh, you, you're on the clock here. And the clock is ticking. You don't have forever to make the changes that you think that you need to make. You don't have that. The clock is ticking. This offer does not last forever. Listen clearly to me, friends. Our clocks are ticking. And you don't have forever to respond to the great message that God has for us. You don't have forever to just sit there and just go, no, the clock is ticking. The Bible teaches us that our life is but a mist. It's but a vapor. It's here today. It's gone tomorrow. And we don't even know. We're not guaranteed tomorrow. The clock is ticking. And the right time to do the right thing is right now, always. Because click, 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 tick, tick. Tick, that clock goes. And there's a time limit. And you don't have forever to respond to the incredible grace of God. Forty days. And Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. They didn't believe Jonah. They believed God, because it's God's message. And a fast was proclaimed, and all of them, from the greatest to the least, put on sackcloth. And when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered him with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he, that the king, issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Don't let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Now listen to this. For who knows? God may yet relent and with compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. So Jonah, he, he's walking through town, he's preaching, and I'm guessing he's preaching with the passion of a guy reading a phone book, okay? Because he, he doesn't like these people at all. Like, the end is near, the end is near, okay? Oh, you guys heard it? 
And so he's doing that, and the people, they, they respond. And Jonah is just shocked. He's just, he's just, he can't believe it. I mean, the, the idea that a Jewish prophet walking into this godless nation, proclaiming a message from the God of Israel, that these people would listen to them. I mean, why would they listen to this guy? I mean, why would they listen to this guy? He's just been vomited up by a fish. Why would you listen to him? Well, here, there are actually, history tells us there are three things that are kind of going on at the same time in, around the city of Nineveh that kind of catches their, their attention. First thing is, is that there was a total eclipse of the sun that had just taken place. Total eclipse of the sun, not the heart. That's something different, but total eclipse of the sun. And for the ancients, that was like a bad omen. It's like, oh, no, something bad's about to happen. Okay? Then the other thing that's happening is up to the north, there, there's this coalition of tribes that are getting their armies together, and they're working their way south. They're about 100 miles away from Nineveh, ready to attack. And so it's like, oh, no, people aren't as scared of us as they used to be. So they're seeing that. And then the other thing is that within five years, they've gone through two major plagues, and all kinds of their people have died from those things. And so whenever you've got the prophet of a former enemy walking through your town saying, you got 40 days or it's all over for y'all, they were primed for repentance. They were ready to hear. And so they heard the word from God, they believed God, and they repented of their wicked ways. And friends, if you were reading this back then, if you like opened up Facebook in 775 BC and you read about this taking place, you'd been... Yeah, this one got past the algorithm somehow because there's no way this is true. Because Nineveh would be like the least likely city to ever repent. It, this would be like me getting up here this morning and saying, hey, y'all, before I preach today, I just want to tell you something. I was scrolling through Facebook, you know, before the service, and I saw on Facebook that the city of Las Vegas made a decree that they're going to change all of their casinos and all of their strip clubs into churches and places for the poor. <laughs> and you would laugh, Right? And you go, no, that's fake news, man. That's not right. That's not true. That's not, exa- that's not what's going on at all. Well, whenever you would read this about Nineveh, that's what you would say. It would make more sense for Las Vegas to turn casinos and strip clubs into churches than for Nineveh to repent with their pyramids of beheaded heads sitting outside city gates. It was scandalous. But they, they repented. Their repentance led them to action. Look, they, they put on sack, sackcloth. Uh, that's just clothes made of goat hair, which you wore those because it felt bad. <laughs> You're welcome. You're welcome. <clears throat> but you just wore that because it just made you feel miserable. And you're like, we don't deserve to wear regular clothes. They, did, they, they declared a fast. And it was a, it, was a, it was a really strict fast. No food, no drink. And then they even took it all the way down to not just people, but animals. Like, don't even let your, your, your cattle have anything to eat or drink. Now, I've, I've read this. I don't know if this is 100% true, but this is what I, what I read, is that supposedly if you've got 20 head of cattle and you don't give them food for a day, you can hear them from half a mile away. That's how loud they get. And I tend to believe this because whenever my kids were little, um, if you didn't give them food for like an hour, you could hear them from a half mile away, right? You know, that's kind of what it is. And so Nineveh here, what they're doing is they're just like urgently calling out to God. They're, they're hoping for his mercy. You know, like, oh, you know, maybe, 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 who knows? God may relent from his anger. Maybe he'll do that. And so they responded immediately. Here's what I find interesting. So, so Jonah, his entire, you know, his entire prophet career, he has heard from God who knows how many times. And yet he didn't obey God. He'd heard words from God who knows how many times, but yet he hear, hears this one. He's like, ah, no, I'm out. Nineveh had never heard a word from God, but they chose to obey. First word. So here's just kind of what it leads me to believe is that one word is enough to choose to obey or disobey. You just need one word. That's all you need. It says, when God saw that what they did and how they turned from their evil ways. He, he relented. Literally, he had compassion and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. Jonah preaches fire and the Ninevites repent and they respond. And God sees the response and it says he, has, he relents, he has compassion, and he does not bring destruction on them. See, friends, sometimes those who appear to be farthest from God 
are actually closest. And that's Nineveh. Nobody would have thought this of them. And you know what? That's some of us in the room today, right? People would look at your life. And maybe people even say, you know, they just they look at you and they judge you and say, ah, that's, that is somebody that's far from God. You know, if you need, a, you need a poster child from far from God, that, that's him. That, that's her. And so, you, you know, you, you feel that way. You, you feel like you're somebody who could never come to God. Oh, please, would you let your heart break? Would you let your heart break like, like Nineveh? And would you repent? And would you turn to him? And, and you know what? You don't have to pray the same prayer, you know, because you don't have to pray. Who knows? God may relent. No, 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 no. Because of Jesus, we can say, we know. If you repent, God will relent. He will forgive. He will show grace. He will show mercy. He will forgive your sins. He will bring you back into the fold. Because this is about God's grace on display. No matter who you are. Whether you're a prophet like Jonah or there's a city like Nineveh. This is about God's grace. Verse 1, Jonah gets grace. Verse 10, Nineveh gets grace. That's what God does here. Why does this happen? This is the last lesson from this text. It's this. Obedience leads to repentance. Obedience leads to repentance. Jonah's obedience leads to Nineveh's repentance. God gives them a second chance. So, so listen to me. What will the impact of your obedience be? And who is it going to impact? Whose life is it going to change? What generations is your obedience going to change? Dads, let me, let me just talk to you for just a second. Dads, if you will put your faith in Jesus, if you'll repent and if you will start leading your family in that way, if you will start heading off in that direction, I want to tell you, you are not just correcting your path whenever you repent and begin to follow Jesus. Oh, it's so much bigger than that. Because you're not just correcting your path. You are setting a new path for your kids, for your grandkids, for your great-grandkids. Because our generations can be blessed or cursed by our choices. And so you follow him because your obedience can lead to others' repentance and changing their lives as well. See, God wants to show us grace because he is a God of second chances. And whenever he presents that second chance to you, for the love of everything that is holy, would you take it and seize it and then just watch what your obedience leads others to? So the bottom line this morning is very simple. It's just this. God forgives a broken and repentant heart. So lay it before him today and stop running from him and start running with him. God of heaven, to you we pray, seeking to turn from ways to which we should not have been going and to run with you, not from you. And God, we ask that in this moment that you would give us that word that we need, whether it's for the first time, the second time, the third time, 112th time, whatever it is, that you would give us that extra chance, that second chance, because God, we know the clock is ticking. We know that we don't have forever and that we would hear you. We would turn to you and we would run with you. God, thank you for your grace, your amazing grace that has been made possible through Jesus, his life given for us. And it says in his name that we pray. Amen. Friends, our God is a God of second chances. And for Jonah, it's a second chance to do everything over and to get it right. For us, it's the opportunity to repent of our own self-will and surrender to the will of God. And whenever we repent and we submit to that will of God, our lives are changed, and the lives of those around us will be changed. They will be impacted. 
and, it's, and we can shift gears. We can change our direction and stop running from him and start running with him. Thank God for second chances. Praise God for third chances. That even though we run from him, he gives us the grace to run with him. And we don't deserve this. We have not earned it. And it cost God his one and only son to give us this chance. So if you're ready to stop running from and start running with him, we want to give you a chance to do that. We're we're going to sing a song, and I'm going to be down here at the front. Our prayer partners will be down here at the front. And if you're ready to say that, I want to quit running from him. I want to run with him. We're going to invite you to come up. We'll pray over you. We'll talk with you about what this looks like. So let's stand. Let's sing. If you are ready to start running with him and stop running from him, we invite you to come today. Thank you so much for uh, being with us this morning. Um, if today, if there is something that God's doing in your life and you just want somebody to pray over you or to talk with you about a decision and, you know, coming up during a song just scares you, we understand. I want to invite you over to our Next Steps room out these doors and, and to the left there. And our prayer partners will be there and they'd love to pray with you, to talk with you about what God's doing in your life in this moment. Okay? And remember, the clock is ticking. Seize the moment. Um, if you're a guest, we'd love a chance to say hello to you out at the uh, guest service kiosk, so please stop on by. Um, we'd love a chance to get to know. I want to invite you all back next week as we wrap up Jonah. Unfortunately, the story doesn't end here, okay? Um, next week, we're going to see how Jonah really is kind of like a Seinfeld episode, and um, we're, we're going to just be able to see something there that's just kind of disheartening, and so I hope you'll join us for that. Then in two weeks, we're going to start a new series called House Rules, and uh, we'll be talking about you know marriage, family, singleness, all that kind of fun stuff there, and just how we can be as followers of Christ, um, how that, we can let that rule in our house. So we love you all very much. I'm going to pray over you. We're going to see you all back here next Sunday. So let's do that. God, we thank you for being a God of second chances and help us to see them, help us to seize them. And may we walk out of here in your grace, in your grip. And we pray that in the name of Jesus. Amen.